<laughs> this morning we were talking about, uh, you know, the Buddha practiced uh, stop breathing. Yeah. There's a story I read in the book. Also, John Brahm was telling this story that uh, a meditator practiced and he, you know, uh, his heart stopped beating and no pulse or anything. So they, they sent him to a uh, emergency room. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the doctor, the doctor, you know, he familiar with the, all those, this kind of practice. Yeah. Th then uh, uh, he, after a while, you know, it, his heart start beating again. Yeah. But he, he didn't die, but, you know, no pulse or, or anything. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, exactly. So, it's possible. It's possible to get to a state where you don't breathe anymore, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and also no, yeah, no, no pulse, pulse as well. Yeah, well, it, it, goes, it goes together. Because if you don't breathe, you can't have any pulse. Because uh, if you don't breathe, you will die. So you have to, everything has to stop, yeah. And this is what they say in the suttas. They say that when you get to the four jhana, no breath, uh -huh. no pulse, nothing, no. nothing. It's as if, almost as if you are dead. Yeah. Right. And this no. is the this is the thing. And there's a, there's another story. I know that story there, and uh, I'm not sure. I, there's another story. This is a story of Ajahn Brahm in Thailand, and Ajahn Brahm even in the early days when he was at Wat Nanat Chat, he was a very good meditator already. <laughs> So every day they would sit on the stage, all the monks would be on the stage uh, and they would do meditation and the lay people would be also be there doing meditation practice. Uh, and then uh, apparently Ajahn Brahm, he was just sitting on the stage meditating and after a while all the other monks would go and he was the only one left. <laughs> and there was this one lady who also was a very keen meditator, yeah? so everyone left except for Ajahn Brahm and there was this one lady there, maybe an Upatak or something like that. Uh, and then after a while she was looking at Ajahn Brahm and he was absolutely still. No movement, yeah? You couldn't see breathing, couldn't see anything, yeah? absolutely nothing. And as I like to say, even the mosquitoes were confused because the, mo <laughs> the mosquitoes, if they, they don't know, yeah? If you, if you are completely still, they don't know, are you a tree or are you a human being? Are you a rock? What are you? So the mosquito goes round and round and round, uh, cannot, cannot settle down, yeah? Does, the mosquito doesn't know what to do. Uh, so the mosquito really confused. Uh. So, uh, <laughs> so after a while, this lady, this old Thai lady, she never seen anything like this before. She looks at Ajahn Brahm, looks at him, completely still, three hours, four hours, nothing happening. And then eventually, she goes out, she leaves the room, and she goes out to the other monks, and she goes to the other monks and says, there's a monk inside on the stage, he's dead. <laughs> 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 because no movement, yeah. It's kind of spooky, when you see somebody absolutely still, it's really spooky, yeah. can't see any breath, can't see anything. Yeah. And this is the only way that that works, is that the whole metabolism of the body goes down to zero. So there's no pulse, there's no heartbeat, there's nothing is happening. And you have a kind of like a stable, everything is just in a stable, suspended animation. But you can only do that by, uh, by going through the jhana states. You can't do that through an act of willpower. Huh? And he's doing, trying to do it through an act of willpower. Huh? And that's why it is not working here. Huh? And that's the problem here. Huh? Is that what you're asking about? Or is that your, your comment or is it... Uh, just sharing, okay, good. Just sharing, okay, good. <laughs> so, excellent, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, do I look like Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I heard the story from Ajahn Brahm too. Yeah. He was saying that uh, the only thing that saved him from going to the mortuary <laughs> was because the one of the South was Indian and yeah. he's aware of people who meditate until... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what Venerable was saying, <laughs> that the doctor was, a, was yes. a knowledgeable about it. It was an Indian doctor yeah, and they were kind of knowledgeable about Samad and this kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. So the other Western doctors wouldn't have known. Yeah, they sent him straight so to the... They were sent yeah, straight off to the goes. <laughs> 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 And after a few hours, yeah. the only thing he knew was uh, his body was still warm after so many hours. Yeah. Ah, yeah. That is only, uh, you know, saving grace. Yeah, exactly. If it's cold, then they would know that. Yeah, so make sure when someone looks dead, <laughs> make sure you check the body first, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Temperature, is it cold or hot? So if it's warm, then okay, let them be. Just meditating, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly, if it's not cold, then otherwise, you make bad karma, you send the, you know. 
Yeah, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these stories are very nice. And it, con it just confirms, it confirms what is in the suttas already, because that's what the suttas say. They say that you stop, you stop breathing when you become, go really into deep meditation, so it seems to be true, you know? <laughs> it's kind of nice. So, uh, we, I'm waiting for Wei Yin, because he's kind of supposed to make coffee for me, so she, I'm waiting for the coffee. Important. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, I know, exactly. That's, that's why we, I'm, I'm kind of we're just waiting for the coffee to come. Not, not, we're just kind of biding our time. Yeah? <laughs> but we can, if, you, if anyone wants to make any comments, or ask any questions as we go, as we wait, you please do so. We can uh, probably t Yes, please, Barbara. Yeah? Yes, um, when you were talking about the uh, lecturers in the Buddhist society, uh, uh, studies, he said uh, only about first 50 suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya is genuine. He said in the past, that uh, you know, 50 over and above, uh, it may be tampered with or added on. Or, uh, is uh -huh. it true? Uh, it is, I, I don't know, 50 is very, very, it's a very precise number. I don't know <laughs> if it's possible to be that precise. Um, it's, it's very difficult to know when you, because. Um, uh, you have to have some very clear criteria for what makes mm -hmm. a sutta early and what makes it late. Mm -hmm. And uh, the suttas are often very short, it's very difficult. You don't have enough, often enough information mm -hmm. to really be able to tell whether it's late or early. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the, I think a lot of the material there is fairly late because a lot of it is just repetitions and, and you know, things that uh, they don't really have a very authentic feel about them. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the suttas there, I, a lot of the suttas are found both in the Anguttara and also other places. They're found in the Sangyutta, uh, for example. Some of them are found in the Anguttara and in the Majjhima Nikaya. So there's not a crossover. Uh, so because of the crossover, uh, the, it, it is more likely to be more likely to be authentic. In fact, uh, if, if they are found in both collections, uh, so I don't want to put a number on it. Fifty sounds too low. It sounds too low to me. I, I, I would think it's much more than that. Uh, I think the majority is probably authentic. It's quite authentic. It's only at times when the sutta. Also, it doesn't. Sometimes you have to look at the doctrine yeah, in the sutta. If the teaching, the doctrine there is very different from what is found elsewhere then you have to be careful, and that's when you have to be, you know, you may be not authentic. There is, for example, one sutta that looks like a Jain sutta in the, uh, uh, the Anguttara Nikaya, or Jain, or Jain, I think Jain is actually the proper pronunciation, it doesn't matter. So, that, that, and this uh, Jain sutta, uh, it basically says that you only make, become awakened, or you only reach enlightenment when you make an end of all kama. Uh, to make a end of all kama, first of all. Yeah, this is a Jain, this is a very Jain thing here. And uh, there was a, Analysis then of that sutta by Venerable Analoyo, he's one of the main people who translate from the Chinese Agamas and the Tibetan and every, he does it from everything and does comparative study. And he reckons it actually was come from the Jains originally and somehow a Jain idea made its way into the suttas. So in those situations, it's quite important to be able to divide out what is Buddhist and what is not. Uh, but in cases where the suttas just reinforce the ordinary Buddhist ideas, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, don't have to really find out. So only be careful with those suttas that look strange and look unusual. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bhante, yeah. Uh, last year I went for a pilgrimage. Yeah. And uh, in Kapilavastu. Okay. So I asked yeah. the Bhante there. Yeah. I mean, the, um, a question which uh, it doesn't seems to be able to answer. Well. Um, there were a lot of stories about Jatakas, about the past life of Buddha, yeah. and but we know very little about Buddha before he get out of the palace from Kapilavastu. Yes. So um, I would like to actually break it down. No, pal no palace, right? No palace, just state house. Yes, state yes, house. the yeah. state house. Okay, so, yeah, so yeah. from <laughs> the from from year one to year five, yeah. and from year six to year ten, from year eleven, I mean from year. 11, 11 years old to say 15, yeah. so every five years. As we know that he got married around 17 or 19, he didn't have Rahula until when he was 28, mm -hmm. he left the palace at say, State House, sorry, at 29. Mm -hmm. So we know that Rahula is a chain to him. So he knew that there's so much suffering in, in life, but 
yet he took 10 years to produce a baby and that yet to run away from the state house. Mm. So I need to understand a little bit more about he before he left his uh, state house and that uh, any stories apart from he got into jhana when he was uh, right five years old and um, so there, I need to yeah. know a little bit more about Buddha. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is very little information available that is, uh, that is reliable. Uh, most of the information is uh, mythological and uh, legendary and uncertain. So the, and this is why you know, the, that sutta we're talking about yesterday is really one of the few suttas that talks about the Buddha before uh, he left his stilt house. Not, not, not the palace, a stilt house. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, so, and then there's a small passage here which comes up next where he talks about thinking back when his father was uh, plowing the fields or whatever and then he uh, got, got into jhana, you know, that story you, know, you obviously know about already. And the, the rest of the information you know, is, is unreliable even when, at what age, Rahula, how old he was when Rahula was born, I, even that is uncertain. The, the, the information that you are quoting now is not information found in the suttas, it's found, I don't know where it is found, maybe the Jataka Nidana or something like that, the, 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 ori you know, the origin of the Jataka stories. That's where most of this information is found. But that was written down a long time after the Buddha, and nobody knows where that information comes from. Some of it may be early, it may have been memorized properly, Mo a lot of it is it very likely to not have been memorized properly at all. Uh, a lot of it is like the stories that kind of they made up that sound, made it sound good. Uh, you know, the idea that Kapilavastu was an enormous town. Well, you have been there, you know it's not an enormous town, it's a small little place, yeah. And uh, which, which Kapilavastu did you go to, the one in Nepal? Both, you went to both of them, okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So I think the one in India is more likely to be the original one because uh, uh, they actually found some coins there, some things in, inscribed by Kapilavastu, the archaeological uh, expedition. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> that is very good. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Excellent. Thank you. Oui. <laughs> it's nice to be a monk, right? <laughs> So, uh, so the, the information is very uncertain and we don't really know about these things. We don't even know if the Buddha actually had a wife. It's, we don't know that. Uh, even that information is late. We know he had a son, uh, but we don't exactly <laughs> whether, whether he has a wife. You know, in that sutta it talks about all the dancing girls. Uh, maybe one of those dancing girls was the mother of Rahula. Yeah? We just don't know. It does, it, because it doesn't actually say anywhere. Uh, it's only later sources that says that uh, uh, and the only thing he's called in the Vinaya, she's called Rahula Mata, which means the mother of Rahula. That's the only name she has in any of the canonical texts. So it is all very uncertain. Uh, and because of that, I, you know, it's just speculation really when we get into those areas. Uh, yeah. I don't have any s divine powers or supernormal powers and re recall back into those days. That's the way to do it, yeah? Meditate pr properly, practice really hard, uh, then remember your past lives, go back to the time of the Buddha, and then you see for yourself <laughs> with your own eyes. Uh, yeah? That's the way to do it. So now you have a job, you have a job. This is the research for you. This is real research. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So, shall we get back to the, our story? Uh, um, before I do that, I will just uh, enjoy uh, Wei-Yin's Nice gift, a little bit there. Uh. <laughs> Where is she? She's gone already. Uh. Okay. Making more coffee? Okay. So. Um. Ah, there she is. Okay. Good. Uh. No, we're not waiting for you at all. Uh, we were just wondering what happened to you because suddenly you disappeared. Uh, we, we were getting worried. Plain water. Wow. Gee, I have to start drinking faster. So. <laughs> so much. Okay, let, let us continue. So, uh, the Buddha is asking the question could there be another path to awakening here? And uh, so he has given up on all the others, or all the ones that existed in. India at the time, they haven't really worked out, so now he has to forge his own way, his own path, and he has to think uh, independently of all the others. Uh, I considered, I recall that when my father the Sakyan was occupied, uh, well I was sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree. 
quite secluded or completely secluded, if you like, from sensual objects, secluded from the unwholesome qualities, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Could that be the path to awakening? Then following on that memory came the realization that is indeed the path to awakening. This is quite powerful, isn't it? He, the jhana is said to be uh, literally the path to awakening itself. And this is what uh, the Buddha says here. So obviously a very important passage to understand the nature of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and this, of course, is the last factor. He has already uh, completed the other factors because he has done all the preliminary work. And this is just the last remaining uh, piece in the jigsaw. And suddenly the picture becomes clear. Uh, and based on that, of course, that is where he, he is able then to make the breakthrough to awakening. Uh, and uh, they... Of course, one of the questions that always comes up at this stage is why does he have to think back all the way till he was a child and he was sitting in the uh, cool shade of the rose apple tree? Uh, actually, he doesn't say it was a child here, he just says, My father is like him. Sorry? It says nothing about his age. Yeah, it, just, it just says that he was. He was sitting there, he was just chilling out. We don't know how old he was. Okay, but it was before he became a monk, obviously. Uh, and um, so why does he think back to this? Why does he not think about the time when he was practicing under Alara Kalama and Uddhakaramaputta? What is the reason for that? And this is, a, a, it is in many ways actually an interesting question. It may not matter that much, but is nevertheless it is interesting. And I'll just give you a couple of possible reasons why that may be the case. And one of the reasons is the one that we were discussed, just discussing before, that the states under Alara Kalama and Uddhra may not have been uh, the full immaterial attainments. Yeah, there may have been something less than that. Uh, there may not have been the jhana states. There may have been a uh, state of samadhi prior to jhana, for example. Uh, that is one possibility. Uh, um, <coughs> and I, gave a, a, I told you a little bit of evidence for that before. But uh, another reason, which per perhaps is more likely, uh, and this is one of those uh, uh, important things to understand a little bit about how the Buddhist path actually works, uh, is that uh, uh, Samma Samadhi in the suttas, right Samadhi, yeah, is defined as the jhana states plus supported by the other seven factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, this is Sama Samadhi. So it is only, it's not jhana in itself, but only when it is supported by the other seven factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And of course, when he was staying with Uddhakaramaputta and Alara Kalama, these were probably Brahmanical traditions. In the Brahmanical tradition, yes, they did practice jhana, samadhi and all of that, but it was based on wrong view. Yeah, the Brahmanical tradition is all about Mahabrahma, it's all about God, it's about uh, gaining a state of non-duality with the whole world. The world and the self are the same, Brahma and the world are the same. So it's very much more like a, a theistic religion, like Christianity or Islam or something like that, where you have a God and you want to seek unity with God. And then it's an eternalist idea, where you live on forever after. So these teachings were conjoined with wrong view yeah and that's why they were problematic he had kind of left left that behind as being wrong and that's why he couldn't really use that to help him move forward because it was assumed to be wrong view instead he thinks back to the time earlier on when he was not didn't have any uh, uh, ideas uh, about you know a god or anything like that, but you might call a metaphysical idea or something about the nature of the world. Didn't have any of those ideas. He was young, he was innocent, uh, and he just enjoyed a jhana experience coming out of the blue because he was obviously very pure. Yeah, at this stage, uh, and that's why he had to go back to that time when there was no taint of wrong view. Uh, he all he had was a pure jhana experience. Uh, and that, uh, and that to me is a very likely reason why he had to think back to that time. Uh, and this is a very important point. Sometimes the suttas talk about Micha Samadhi and Samma Samadhi. What is Micha Samadhi? And Micha Samadhi is really a, 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 it, it can be a Samadhi state, but it is a Samadhi state that has 
wrong view based, baked into it. And when it has wrong view as part of it, it means that when you then try to make, you, you, you don't go any further. Yeah, you found a jhana, wow, this is it, I found God, okay, that's it, finished, stopped. The path has been come to an end. And that's why it blocks you from going any further on the path. So um, uh, this is, I think this may very well be the reason why uh, it happened in this way. Yeah. It's a very common question in Buddhist circles, uh, and I think that is likely to be the answer. Anyway, so he enters the first jhana, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. This is, uh, uh, this is Vivicheva Kamehi, Vivicheva Kamehi, and uh, uh, plural kamehi is a plural ending. It's a, a, called an ablative ending. This is a grammar. This is a grammatical thing. And when the kama is in the plural, it usually refers to the objects of the senses. So that's why I would say that means uh, uh, fully secluded from the uh, five senses might be a better translation than from sensual pleasures. Uh, because uh, sensual pleasures has more of a feeling of a desire related to it. But this actually refers to the five senses when used in the plural. That is my understanding of this word, and it is also the understanding of some of the best dictionaries you find on the Pali language. Secluded from unwholesome states, akusalehi vivicha akusalehi damehi. Akusalehi damehi literally means something like unwholesome or or harmful dhammas qualities. Yeah, and this refers to the five hindrances usually. Yeah, unwholesome qualities are usually the five hindrances. So secluded from the five hindrances and include secluded from the five senses. This is that first one there. And this is uh, important because uh, one of the things about the jhanas, they, you know, in the world of Buddhism people discuss uh, jhana light or jhana, what's the opposite of jhana light? Jhana heavy? No, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Uh, jhana, uh, full jhana and kind of light jhana and, and there's a lot of discussion about what are the real jhanas. But uh, in my opinion, if you read these things uh, uh, carefully, uh, jhanas are very, very profound states. Uh, and in the suttas, they are always conjoined with the four stages of awakening. Uh, yeah, the four stages of awakening and the four jhanas always go together. Uh, so these are roughly, they are that level, they are the same, similar kind of happiness as the happiness that you gain from awakening itself. Uh, so these are very profound things. And when people say, yeah, jhana is not so hard, yeah, you just think a little bit and you feel a bit of joy and bang, you're in jhana, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me uh, at all. These are really, really profound things. That's why they are called uttari manusadamas, uh, qualities beyond the ordinary human state. Uh, yeah, you really enter a different world when you get to these things. Allang arya nanadasana visesa, the distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Actually, in that case, they are called knowledge and vision. Yeah, the, the jhanas are called knowledge and vision. Distinction in knowledge and vision. When you have the jhanas, you also have a special knowledge and vision. And it shows you that to attain a jhana, you need a lot of insight. Yeah, sometimes people say, yeah, you're just practicing jhana, not vipassana, vipassana much more, much better, yeah, forget about it. But actually, you can't, because samatha vipassana always goes together. If you go into a deep jhana state, then you also have a lot of wisdom. It's just impossible not to have that wisdom because you have given up so much of the world already. These things always have to go together. They come from the same cause, from the same root, and then they go together in this way. Anyway, I'm not going to spend too much time on this now because we are supposed to discuss the life of the Buddha. Uh, so that is the, f it goes into the first jhanas. Let's leave it at that. And then he realizes this is the path to enlightenment, yeah? And we wonder why hasn't he realized this before? And then this is what the next paragraph tells us why he hasn't realized this before. I thought, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual, with, uh, sensual objects and unwholesome qualities? I thought, I'm not afraid of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome qualities. So the point seems to be is that he was mistaken. He thought that uh, uh, all pleasure is to be to be afraid of all kinds of pleasure. Uh, that's what he also we saw the uh, Bodhiraja Kumara Sutta before, yeah, where he says that before 
Happiness is to be gained through suffering, happiness is not to be gained through happiness. But now he realized, actually, that is a mistake. What we need to do instead, we need to analyze the pleasures and put the bad pleasures on one side and the good pleasures on another side. And once we do that, then not only is pleasure okay, actually that happiness and pleasure is actually necessary to gain awakening here. This is what he's suddenly seeing. He's starting to analyze happiness and divide it up in the right way. Here. And this is what we should all do in our life. We all should do that and remember those happinesses that are useful. Uh, the happinesses that come from living well, from doing the right thing, they are always positive. Uh, and the happinesses that come that are worldly happinesses, they are usually the bad ones. The happinesses of, from sensuality, uh, it's not very bad. So, uh, but uh, especially the happiness that come from being immoral, that is really bad, obviously, uh, and very detrimental to the practice. Uh. So this is what is happening here. Uh. He is starting to really consider these things carefully here. Uh. So then he uh, considers further. I considered it is not easy to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. Uh. Suppose I ate some solid food, some boiled rice and porridge. And I ate some solid food, some boiled rice and porridge. Yeah, so um, here he uh, starts uh, turning around again, he moving towards the middle way, uh, understanding that the middle way is what makes the jhanas possible. Uh, the jhanas in one sense are the uh, epitome, uh, the highest expression of the middle way. Uh, that's what they are. And uh, uh, to get there you have to kind of go away from these two extremes. You have to eat properly, uh, you have to relax properly, you have to do the right thing. Uh, and all this pain and, uh, is actually uh, problematic. Uh, so this is what we are seeing here. The middle way is now being uh, born, coming out of this. And of course, soon afterwards, the first teaching of the Buddha that he gives to the five ascetic is precisely the teaching on the middle way, because this is what he has realized very recently before her. Now at that time the five bhikkhus were waiting upon me, thinking, if our recluse Gotama achieves some higher state, he will inform us. But when I ate the boiled rice and porridge, the five bhikkhus were disgusted and left me, thinking, the recluse Gotama now lives luxuriously. He has given up the striving and reverted to luxury. A little bit of boiled rice and porridge and you are living in luxury. <laughs> pretty, <laughs> whoa, pretty harsh, harsh, harsh criteria. And here, here I am, look at me, I, whoa, this is maybe, <laughs> this is really living in luxury, isn't it? <laughs> So uh, it's, this and this this tells you about the general outlook at that time. The general outlook was one of very strict asceticism or self-mortification. That was the accepted way of doing things. Uh, and if you didn't do that, you were considered lax and luxurious. Uh, yeah. And here the Buddha, he's, he's almost died from from these ascetic practices, uh, and still is not good enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So sometimes, uh, sometimes you need to be really independent. You need to be stand on your own two feet and do things your own way, even to the point where everyone else kind of just departs and are disgusted with you, because you know that something is uh, isn't right. Uh, so it's good that the Buddha was so the Buddha to be was so uh, such a strong person, so he was able to deal with these things. Uh. Now, when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, uh, then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome qualities, uh, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied and applied by sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Uh, and I have uh, uh, abbreviated that because then comes the four jhanas. Uh, after the four jhanas you have the three vijjas, uh, yeah, the, the uh, uh, re recalling of past life and all of that, and then the, finally you have the breakthrough to arahantship, uh, and that comes in there as part of Majjhimanikaya 36. I left that out uh, because uh, um, uh, I, d I don't think it is really required at this point to go through all of that, uh, so just to get back to the life of the Buddha again in the more general sense. Uh. So that was the critical thing, yeah? The critical thing was the idea of uh, applying yourself and experience the jhanas. The jhanas are the kind of the, 
uh, the final piece of the puzzle of the Noble Eightfold Path that completes the path uh, and then makes the awakening experience possible. Uh, not only awakening, but also the recollection of past lives too becomes possible through this. Uh, and then when you see the horrors of samsaric existence, uh, then you make that final effort, you make the breakthrough, you break out of the eggshell. And that nice simile of breaking out of the eggshell, bang, wow, this is the world. And then you see reality for what it actually is. And then eventually you become fully enlightened as a consequence of that. All of these things are so nice and so beautiful and so worthwhile considering. But now let us continue with what happens next in the story of the Buddha. So um, this coming back to Majjhima Nikaya 26 again, and this is how the awakening experience is explained in that sutta in, very, in brief. Then because being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger, yeah, the suffering in what is subject to birth, seeking the unborn supreme security from bondage, uh, or the freedom from birth, uh, extinguishment, I attained that freedom from birth, uh, the supreme rest from exertion, extinguishment, uh, being myself <coughs> subject to old age, uh, being myself subject to illness, uh, being myself subject to death, uh, being myself subject to sorrow, uh, being myself subject to defilement, yeah, I repeat in the same all the way through, uh, having understood the danger in what is subject to, let's just stick to death, uh, what is subject to death, seeking the freedom from death, uh, uh, the supreme uh, security from bondage, or supreme rest from exertion, extinguishment, I attained the freedom from death, uh, the supreme rest from exertion and extinguishment. Uh, and then the same for all the other factors that are there. Uh, and then uh, when that happened, uh, the knowledge and vision arose in me, on page 37, uh, my deliverance is unshakable, uh, this is my last birth, uh, now there is no renewal of existence. Uh, there you are, and that is the vision of the Arahant. This is what you know when you become an Arahant. Uh, my deliverance, my, my freedom, my liberation is unshakable. There is no returning back again. So if you didn't like Nibbana, tough luck. Now you, there's nothing more to do. <laughs> uh, this is my last birth. Now there is no renewal of being. Uh, and this is what the Arahants know. Uh, and this is what they what they find, and then they have solved the puzzle of the meaning of life. They have found the meaning of life, finally. No more uh, running around trying to seek something you never find. Here, the answer has been finally been discovered. And this is what this really means. So a very powerful moment. And of course, the next thing then, once you have found the meaning of life, well, it is kind of natural to think, Teach others, yeah, all these other people, they are suffering out there, and they are suffering because they don't really understand. I have the insight, maybe I should teach others. This is kind of the next one that comes naturally. <coughs> if we think of the traditional bodhisattva idea, the idea is that the Buddha already had practiced uh, out of compassion for others, but actually in the suttas there's nothing about that. In the suttas, the motivating force for the Buddha is death. Yeah, the fact that he's going to die, suffering and all of that, that is what makes him uh, a uh, ascetic or makes him a monk. Yeah. And there's nothing there about compassion. But once he has found the answer, uh, once he has found that there is a solution, then it is natural for compassion to arise. Uh. But before that, we have a little episode which is found in the Pali version. But very interestingly, this little episode is not actually found in the Chinese translation of this sutta. Huh? And this is kind of uh, fascinating. And we'll discuss in a minute which version is more likely to be correct about this. Uh. And this is uh, the following one. Uh, I consider this Dhamma that I have attained is profound, hard to see, hard to understand subtle to be experienced by the wise. But this generation, in other words, these people, all these people around me, uh, delight in attachment, take delight in attachment, rejoice in attachment. Uh, it is hard for such people to see this truth, uh, namely specific conditionality dependent origination. Uh, and it is hard for them to see this truth, namely the stilling of all 
activities, intentional activities, the relinquishment of all ownership, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation and extinguishment. If I were to teach the Dhamma, others would not understand me, and that would be wearying and troublesome for me. So, um, the Buddha seems to think it's troublesome to teach the Dhamma. It sounds a little bit strange, perhaps. I, of course, the Buddha probably would prefer to kind of just sit down and just, you know, enjoy jhanas and other things, probably. But uh, still, it is a little bit strange that he would kind of not find it wearisome and troublesome. But anyway, you can kind of understand the reasoning here. You can understand the reasoning why it is something very difficult to understand. Yeah, it is it's obviously a very profound insight. The way it is described here, uh, it is very profound. And you can understand that the Buddha may have had doubts whether other people could understand this. Yeah, he, I mean, look at what he's gone through. He's almost died in trying to find the solution. Maybe nobody else will understand. It is so contrary to our intuition, so contrary to, you know, to what people want. This idea of cessation, the idea of ending, the idea of non-self and all this. Actually, often people think this dumb, I don't have anything to do with this dumb, it's just too weird. Yeah, it's too kind of strange, it's too crazy. Many people think that. But uh, so you can understand why the people, why the Buddha was a bit reluctant, and you can see that in the later stages when he then goes out and he decides to teach the group of five monks. Yeah, at the very end of that teaching, that's the first teaching of the Buddha, the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta. He t gives that teaching, and at the end of that sutta, Anya Kondanya understands. He becomes a stream enter, and then the Buddha says. Anyasi vatabo kondanyo, anyasi vatabo kondanyo. And vatabo is like an exclamation of surprise almost. Yeah, wow, kondanya understands, kondanya understands. It's as if the Buddha is surprised. Yeah, he didn't know it was possible to transmit that until he had done it and it actually he understood. So this, it kind of makes a bit, bit of sense. Yeah, he's worried that nobody will understand this. And you can see that. <coughs> in the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, that the Buddha actually is genuine, genuinely surprised. And then later on, when he teaches, he, uh, one of his teachings is about the, he talks about the mirac various kinds of miracles or wonders or marvels that you can do, yeah, that exist in the world. Uh, he talks about the miracle of wonder of mind reading, he talks about the miracle of doing all kinds of supernormal things. But the real miracle, says the Buddha, is the miracle of instruction. Yeah, that's kind of, Astonishing again, it's teaching is a real miracle. All this other stuff is kind of uh, irrelevant. Uh, but the fact that it is possible to teach something so profound and then have other people understand it, uh, that is a real miracle in Buddhism. And uh, this is why, m maybe why, one of the reasons why here we have this sense that the Buddha is concerned. Nobody will understand this. He has the answer to the meaning of life, but it's too profound. Nobody will get it. Uh, yeah, and, and this is probably what happens in the majority of cases. That's probably why we have so many Pacheka Buddhas. Uh, yeah, because they say, oh yeah, I've discovered, oh, too difficult, I'm not going to bother, okay, and they just walk around and collect alms food. Uh, yeah, and they kind of, they're still a blessing in a sense of just being happy and enjoying and receiving alms, uh, but they don't teach anything. Yeah, that's the Pacheka Buddhas. Uh. Fortunately, the Go Gautama Buddha was not the Pacheka Buddha, he became a real teaching Buddha. It was good for, good for the, all of us. Uh. So that is what is going on here. And uh, then he's saying it would be wearisome and bothersome for me to teach. Eh? All these people, what's the point of teaching if nobody will understand? You might as well just relax and chill because uh, it's just too much. So just very briefly, what is this, uh, uh, what, what is this teaching that is so under, hard to understand? Well, it is first of all specific conditionality dependent origination. Why is dependent origination so hard to understand? Well, the, the reason is because it shows a causal process without any essence, inherent essence to it. It's an empty causal process running on uh, with no, no self involved in it. That's why it is so hard to understand. It's just one condition leading to something else uh, and then including rebirth in it. Uh, yeah, and then carrying on, carrying on like that. Uh. So it is very, very difficult to understand when you are when our entire outlook is dependent on uh, this feeling that we have a self inside. And the other part, aspect of it here is the, 
this truth of the Dhamma, the stilling of all formations, which means the stilling of all intentional activity. That's really what it means. Uh, sankara, sabbe, sankara, samata. Uh, so all your intentional activities in the mind come to a halt. Uh, the relinquishing of all acquisitions or all ownership, you, have, you, you give everything up. Yeah, mentally, you still have a few things because you have to have a few things like a ball or whatever, but mentally you have given everything up. No ownership anymore. The ending of craving, dispassion, no more desire for anything, cessation, the ending of all this, these things, nibbana, extinguishment. Extinguishment, does that sound good or bad? Unsure? Are you unsure? Sounds, sounds, it's hard to know, right? Extinguishment? Yeah, I guess, you know, if it means extinguishment of defilements, okay, that sounds pretty good. But what if it means extinguishment of the five khandhas? That's a bit more scary, isn't it? Five khandhas, is, suddenly the person is gone completely. It's hard to know sometimes with these things. You have to practice this and gradually kind of approach it. And uh, the extinguishment, it, one of the ways to look at the idea of Nibbana is to look at your meditation practice and see what happens when you meditate. And sometimes when you meditate you become more peaceful. And if you look at that peace you have in meditation, that is a little bit of extinguishment. Yeah, you have extinguished a little bit of your thoughts, you have extinguished a little bit of the body. And what does it feel like? Pretty, pretty nice, yeah, actually it's really nice. So if this is what extinguishment is all about, okay, let's have some more of it. And then you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and then eventually you get the hang of what this is all about. And you see, actually, extinguishment is a great blessing in the world. So you all move towards that. But it's hard to really grasp. Theoretically, you really have to have some experience to understand what this is about. So let us move on, because uh, there, are, there is uh, lots of interesting stuff, as always. Thereupon they came to me spontaneously, these verses never heard before. Uh, enough with teaching the Dhamma uh, that, uh, that I, not even, even shouldn't be there, that makes it sound really conceited with even, that I found hard to reach. Uh, for it will never be perceived by those who live in, uh, gre in desire and hate. Those died in desire, wrapped in darkness, uh, will never discern this profound or abstruse Dhamma which goes against the world this dream, subtle, deep and difficult to see. And considering thus, my mind inclined to inaction rather than to teaching the Dhamma. And now comes the interesting part. Then because the Brahma Sahampati knew with his mind the thought in my mind and he considered the world will be lost, the world will perish since the mind of the Tathagata, accomplished and fully awakened, inclines to inaction rather than to teaching the Dhamma. Then just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flexed arm or flex his extended arm, the Brahma Sahampati vanished in the Brahma world and appeared before me. He arranged his upper robe on one shoulder. Interesting, Brahmas also have upper robes, that's quite interesting. <laughs> and extended his hands in reverential salutation towards me, saying, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma, let the Sublime One teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are wasting through not hearing the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. Brahma Sahampati spoke thus, and then he said further, In Magadha there have appeared till now impure teaching devised by those still stained. Open the doors to the deathless, let them hear the Dhamma that the stainless one has found. Just as one who stands on the mountain peak can see below the people all around, so, O wise one, all-seeing sage, ascend the palace of the Dhamma, let the sorrowless one survey uh, this human breed, engulfed in sorrow, overcome by birth and old age. Arise, victorious hero, caravan leader, deathless one, and wonder in the world that the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand. It's quite nice verse. Uh, 
I think it is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, it says in Magda they have appeared till now impure teaching. There must mean all these other teachers wandering around. That's probably what it is referred to. And now finally we have someone who understands the has understood reality. Please teach all these other people. They are no good. And then all these beautiful epithets of the Buddha: caravan leader, victorious hero, deathless one. Yeah, this is kind of the uh, the uh, all the descriptions of the Buddha standing on the mountain peak, standing above it all, with the bird's eye view, having an insight into the nature of reality. Yeah. So did this actually happen? Huh? Did Brahma Sahampati come down and ask the Buddha to teach? Maybe? Yes, you think he, he did? Yeah? Yeah? Maybe? It's, yeah? It's, it's an interesting question because it is not something that we normally see. We don't normally see Brahmas coming down and kind of intervening in human affairs. Yeah? We don't see that in the present day. So the question is, did it happen at this time? And uh, whenever something like this happens in the suttas, which is a little bit uh, supernatural, uh, there's always a good question to ask whether it really happened or not. Because a lot of the time, when you find this in one version of the sutta, in another version it may not happen. Uh, and this is what is so interesting about the, uh, uh, the, the one in the um, Madhyama Agama, the one that's translated into Chinese, because that one does not have this episode. This whole episode we have been reading about now, all the way from uh, uh, the Dhamma being too profound to teach, including Sahampati coming down and then eventually making the Buddha teach, all of that is missing in the version in, uh, the, translated into Chinese. Yeah, it's fascinating, and you wonder which one is right. And um, I must admit, I tend to like the ones that are simple and elegant. The more simple the sutta is, the more likely it is to be early. Things tend to get added rather than subtracted from the suttas because people think that we need to add things yeah, because it isn't complete or whatever. But if you subtract, it's like you're taking away the word of the Buddha. And that is much more difficult to do psychologically because it is as if you are destroying the Dhamma a little bit. But uh, the main point of this passage here, and the reason why it may have been added later on, is to understand that this is in a sense a way of persuading the population in India that Buddhism is the best. Yeah, imagine, we are now in India, the vast majority of the population are are Brahmanical, yeah, they are like the precursors of Hinduism, yeah, and they all believe in Brahma. Brahma is the highest God. Yeah, Brahma, this is, this is the unity, the whole universe is Brahma in a sense. And then the Buddha says, actually, this Brahma who is your God, he comes down and worships the Buddha. So which one is best? Brahm Brahmanism or Buddhism? Well, obviously Buddhism must be better if Brahma worships the Buddha. So this is like a, almost like a conversion technique. It's like including the other religions into yours. Yeah? Brahma is a Buddhist. You didn't know that, did you? You forgot that. You, you may believe in Brahma, that's okay. But remember, Brahma is actually a Buddhist. That's why he's bow bowing down to the Buddha. Oh yeah, you have a point. Brahma's a Buddhist. Okay, so I better be a Buddhist too. And then, of course, you convert and everyone becomes a Buddhist as a consequence. So this is like one of these, uh, almost like a kind of Buddhist propaganda in a sense. Yeah? And after the Buddha passes away, obviously this sort of propaganda becomes more natural. Yeah? You want to convert other. You have this wonderful teaching, of course you would like other to hear about it. Just like in the present day, if you're a Buddhist, I don't know about you, but I, th I kind of like to teach these teachings because they are so wonderful. And I think we all have a little bit of that in us, and that will happen at that time as well. So these stories that may have been floating around and may have been considered part of uh, the Buddhist teachings, quite likely they were kind of put in there to, uh, to enhance a certain situation. This is my take. Other people, I'm sure they will denounce me as a heretic for saying such things. So, uh, and uh, that's okay, I don't mind being called a heretic, by the way, that's okay. Yeah. Because uh, I'm just telling you what to me seems the most likely thing. I'm not trying to kind of, uh, you know, to, to do anything bad or evil, anything like that. Am I? No, I don't think so. So, uh, uh, so because of that. But this is the way I like it. I like it simple. I like as few supernatural things as possible. So uh, I think even Ajahn Brahm might not agree with me on this one. Huh? So it's, uh, sometimes we have to disagree with your teacher. Huh? 
yeah, it's, it's okay. This is what is, it's good to be able to think independently, not kind of be completely. I like to be maybe not a black sheep, but at least a gray sheep, yeah? <laughs> so I kind of moving in that direction. Not, not too white. Too white is bad. So somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I have interesting arguments with Ajahn Brahm in the monastery here. Yeah. So uh, it's good to have occasional arguments, at least, because uh, otherwise you don't learn anything here. Yeah. So, let, let us continue with this story with Brahma Sahampati and uh, see the rest of this story. And the Buddha thinks, uh, now he is the Buddha, then I listen to the Brahma's pleading, and out of compassion for beings I surveyed the world with the eye of a Buddha. Surveying the world with the eye of a Buddha, I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties and with dull faculties, with good qualities and with bad qualities, easy to teach and hard to teach, and some who dwelt seeing fear and blame in the other world. And the last one there is perhaps the most interesting one. All the other ones we sort of understand. Yeah, some, are, have, some have many defilements, some have few, some have a lot of wisdom, some have little. But the last one is particularly interesting in the idea that there are some people who already are afraid of rebirth. That's what that means. You already see fear of rebirth. And those people are the ones that are, you are likely to be able to teach because they will understand that the ending of rebirth is a very positive thing. Yeah. First of all, you have to believe in rebirth, and then also you have to see the danger in that. Uh, those two things coming together here. Just as a pond of blue or red or white lotuses, uh, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it. Uh, and some other lotuses that are born and grow in water rest on the water's surface. Uh, and some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water rise out of the water and stand clear unwetted by it. So too, surveying the world with the eye of the Buddha, I saw beings with all these various qualities. Then I replied to Brahma Sahampati in verses, Open for them are the doors to the deathless. Let those with ears now show their faith. Thinking it would be troublesome, O Brahma, I did not speak the Dhamma, subtle and sublime. Then the Brahma Sahampati thought, the Blessed One has consented to my request that he teach the Dhamma, and after paying homage to me, keeping me on the right, that doesn't make any sense, it doesn't mean, it means circumambulating someone with the right side towards them, that's what it really means. Um, uh, he thereupon departed at once. I considered thus, yes, anyway, so there you are, now we come to the end of that particular passage with uh, Brahma Sahampati and the Brahma has kind of allowed the uh, uh, possibility for the teaching of the Dhamma. This is really what has happened here. Uh, and uh, one of the things I perhaps should say, because when I have argued with Ajahn Brahm about this in the past, one of the things Ajahn Brahm said, which is quite nice, is that, uh, well, when you are enlightened, uh, you have become so peaceful and so quiet uh, that you need some kind of impetus to get your teaching. Uh, Otherwise, you will just sit there and be happy. You don't really want to teach, yeah? You need someone to kind of awaken that in you, the compassion or whatever. Yeah? And uh, maybe, the, I think there may be a little bit of truth, probably there must be a lot of truth to that, otherwise you wouldn't say it. Uh, but whether you actually need Brahma Sahampati to do that, or whether all you need to do is go for alms in the morning and look at all the people and chat a little bit to the people, that might be enough. Yeah? Be, it, once you interact with somebody, that impetus might already arise anyway. Uh, so, uh, but it is an interesting point that uh, you become so peaceful uh, that really you don't really want to, your mind doesn't want to uh, get interact anymore. Uh, it reminds me of uh, when Ajahn Brahm, he went on a six month retreat. Uh, Remember that many years ago? Yeah, if, for those of you who've been around, that was in 2003, something like that. It's a while ago now, and I was at Bodhinyana at the time, and we supplied him with food every day. And after six months, he could barely speak. It, was, it wasn't as if he looked crazy, he looked just 
so completely peaceful. He looked at him, he looked absolutely peaceful. And he said he had a headache for the, in the beginning because he kind of had to get his mind going again after six months. It was completely still, there was no movement going on. Yeah. And then he, uh, and from that, I think that is where he gets this idea from that, you know, you, you need someone to kind of spark somebody to get going again because you are so peaceful when you have these incredibly profound experiences uh, that the mind doesn't want to, doesn't want to move again after that. Uh. And uh, the first Dhamma talk Ajahn Brahm gave after those six months was uh, Dhamma talk was six months of bliss. Uh, he had just been blissing out for six months. Uh, he hadn't talked to anybody in six months, uh, staying in a kuti seven square meters and a walking path outside. He had one book in his kuti, Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha. It's the only book he had, yeah? And then uh, that's what he did for six months. Uh, and then when he came out, he was just very, very, very peaceful. Uh, and it was very, very nice, actually. Uh, a very, very beautiful thing. Most people would go completely bananas, but he, he was not uh, bananas. Or, yeah, no, he was not bananas. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a very interesting experience, and I think that is kind of where you get these uh, ideas from in part. Uh. So, um, I will stop there because now we get on to a next section in this particular sutta. So, uh, does anyone have any last questions before we have a short break? Okay, let's have a break. Let's have a 15 minute break and see you back again at quarter to three. Yeah.